Uh, the pallbearers is Robert Fisher III, Adam Fisher, Connor Fisher, Wesley Hatch, James Mather, Seth Fisher, Tate Bradfield, David Taylor, Sam Fisher, Martin Fisher, Robbie Fisher. Honorary pallbearers, Robert Fisher IV, Israel Fisher, Michael Fisher, Caleb Fisher, Candom Hatch, Parker Hatch, Austin Hatch, Hiram Mather, Bryson Mather, Liam Mather, Riker Fisher, Zayden Fisher, Jackson Fisher, Warren Fisher, James Mead, and Tyler Mead. The family prayer was given by Adam Fisher, his son. The prelude, pre postlude, by the traditional hymn. Come now found by Christine Rawlings, Forrester, Kathy Mitchell, sister-in-law accompanist. The invocation, Katie Hatch, daughter, musical no number. Alina Bradfield, Camille Fisher, Emma Taylor, daughters. No other name, uh, Robin Mather and daughter accompanist. Life sketch, Sam Fisher, brother. Piano, and organ melody, Seth Fisher's son, and Robin Math Mather, daughter. I know that my Redeemer lives. Memories. Amy Fisher, daughter, piano solo, praise to the man, Seth Fisher's son. I would like to throw myself in here for some thoughts. Then we will have President Stewart, speaker, the Congress Congregational Hymn on page 239, Choose the right, the benediction, Dave Mitchell, brother-in-law, <coughs> and then we, at the grave site, we will have the dedication of the grave by Robert Dean Fisher III, son, and then there will be military rights of the U.S. Army Honor Guard.
will come. To celebrate our deaths, Lord. We're thankful that families are together forever. And we are thankful for Jesus Christ. And that he knows exactly how we feel. And that we can always rely on him. Holy Father, we ask thee to bless us with thy spirit. Please comfort us. Please protect us. Help us to do what is right. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
That was beautiful. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm honored and humbled to speak today to provide a live sketch <coughs> of my dearest go-to person, friend, and confidant. As I share a couple of mortal stories and journeys that Bobby took, I hope you can appreciate further and love this great man that I've come to have the honor of to call brother. However, similar to the prophet Mormon stated, I cannot write a hundredth part of the things of his life and the good that he's done. So in other words, the life sketch will be the short version. <laughs> On March 11th, 1957, the news of all news were provided to the newly couple, Robert Dean Fisher Sr. and Burl Hewitt Fisher. Burl was pregnant with her oldest child, eight months to the day. October 11, 1957. <clears throat> Bob and Burl found out that Burl could not have their firstborn child normally, so their child came into this world via cesarean delivery. Dr. Bishop told Burl and Bob later that if the baby would have been born normally, their child would have choked to death because the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck twice. So baby boy Fisher was born into this world on October 11th with the blessings of heaven upon him. The first of legions of miracles was provided to this precious little boy who weighed in at six pounds, 14 ounces, and 20 inches long. On November 3rd, Bob Sr. gave their son a name and a blessing. His name was Robert Dean Fisher Jr. <laughs> he was the namesake of his father. He was the first grandson and great grandson of both the Black, Whiting, and Hewer families. Most people in his growing up year knew him as Bobby, in his adult years as Bob. I'll call him Bobby. Bobby was blessed um, at this occasion in a beautiful dress that was given to him by William and Ella Williams, my dad's mother and stepfather, more lovingly known by the kids as Grandma and Grandpa Bill. This was the first and one of the last times Bobby wore a dress, <laughs> especially during the priesthood ordinance. Okay, perhaps the beloved Moo Moo incident may have been the last time, but that's a different story that's been bridged out of this life sketch. <laughs> Soon after Bobby's birth, the young family moved to Hobart, Arizona. Hobart became the childhood training ground of Bobby and his siblings to follow. From primary activities to Pioneer Day celebrations, Cub Scouts to swimming lessons, the shadow behind the home to the top of the hill, and all the caves below, Holly Lake or Big Lake to fish, or just a family reunion, Bobby's childhood was full of fun, adventure with his friends and family. The Fisher household that we grew up in always had young friends over to play games and to have fun. We enjoyed many games of football, baseball, and later on basketball after the cement pad was, was uh, completed. Bobby was always kind enough to me to let me go and to play. I think this is where Bobby gained his competitive spirit. Many of you know that spirit well. Um, it especially came at a time when he tried to beat me at maybe a game of basketball or horse. 
When Bobby was eight years old, uh, he joined the Ward's Cup, Cup Hack, and he received a prize in the pocket bag. It was the best gift that a young boy could receive. On one occasion, well, many occasions, he'd use that very sharp blade to put a wood and make, make different creations. Um, and on one occasion, if I remember right, we were going to the movies. And out came the pocket. Soon the inevitable happened. Bobby cut his leg. We did not go to the movie. And he got a couple of stitches. A tough lesson learned. Um, when he was older, he joined the Boy Scout troop. And my dad and Phil Gardner um, were the scout leaders. Dad and brother Gardner always liked to motivate the boys with food. Um, one day they had a cookout at our home hamburger cookout, and I can't even remember how many there were, probably 12 or so boys, that turned into an eating contest. Figure that. <laughs> After about three or four hamburgers, some of the boys had tapped out, some of them were still asking for more. I don't even think you know where Bobby was. <laughs> it was down to Jeff Decker and Bobby. I believe the both boys quit eating only because there was no more food. <laughs> and uh, Bobby had eaten one more hamburger than Jeff at that point in time, and since there were no more opportunities to, to Jeff to win, Bobby declared himself the winner. <laughs> As many of you know, Bobby loved music. Uh, all of us at a young age began piano lessons, and he began to excel in his newfound talent. It began with chopsticks, fun little tunes. He progressed to music um, from Bach, Beethoven, Handel, Chopin, and Rachmaninoff. Even though Bobby could play a lot of those different types of music, and we, we enjoyed each other's playing, he often would just sit down <coughs> and play your brain hops keep falling in my head. Or other pop songs like that. That was where his love was. But because of his competitive spirit, he did show you that he knew how to play classical music. <laughs> uh, also in high school, he learned how to play the saxophone, did well with that, and played the band. You know, coming from a musical family, there was always a, a desire instilled in each of us to accompany others on the piano. Bobby was a natural, and because he was the first child to be able to accompany mom on the piano, he earned the rights to the upgrade grand piano, which is a treasure. For the family. Not in <laughs> Bobby also at a very long, young age learned how to work and how to work hard. The mantra in the family, uh, in essence, was you work hard so you play hard. I think that kind of trickled down a little bit too. I think of the highlights of being working hard, especially with our grandpa and grandma Hewitt, was to be able to take the 30 minute nap after we ate lunch. <laughs> But at the end of the day, Bobby was still satisfied and complete, especially when we were able to eat the fruits of our labors. Bobby had the opportunity not only to help in my dad's accounting office, but we also experienced the law of the harvest through agricultural experiences at Grand Grand Procure. Free child labor was actively taken advantage of in our lives and strongly encouraged. Some of the work that we had opportunities to experience during our young years included picking apples in the apple orchard, picking grapes and currants, planting a garden, hoeing weeds, parenthetically, while the adults were in chatting, we were out working, um, feeding livestock, milking cows, cutting wood, building and repairing fence, irrigating the alfalfa fields, bucking hay and putting the hay in the barn to be used for livestock later for food or to sell. Even though that sounds like cruel and unusual punishment, it was a continual training ground that we had to learn how to work and to keep working until the job was done, but not only done, but done well. Our pay was never monetary. I don't think I ever received a dime from my grandpa for working, but it was always in the form of good food, feeling good about our efforts, and being able to be with our uncles and our grandpa. When Bobby was in high school, he began to excel in sports. Um, he may not have gotten straight A's and B's, 
but he always had a good, he made sure he had good enough grades to be able to play sports. He lettered in football, baseball, and wrestling. In his senior year, he, with the entire wrestling team, went down to about the Phoenix area to, to the wrestling state championship. As in so many wrestling tournaments previous to state, Bobby once again wrestled against Snowflake's Ray Bryant for the state championship. Because Bobby's hard work and the privilege of some awesome coaches, Bobby won the state championship and Holbrook took the title as a team. What a great year that was. We saw the viewing, we saw him on the podium, um, holding the, the bracket and being a state champ. Later on that summer, um, Bobby wanted to go to nationals because he was state champion, he could go to nationals. And he and his, many of his teammates went to the Midwest to, to wrestle in a tournament. Unfortunately, Bobby dislocated his shoulder and was out of the tournament. A tough price to pay. <clears throat> for a champion. Bobby also liked fast cars and adventures that went with them. I remember he and Richard Tanner were always fighting a speedy adventure, especially between Holbrook and Snowflake. They were the Arizona version of the Dukes of Hazard, <laughs> And they lived to tell many a story about it. I had some moments I could tell you uh, a few of them. Um, Bobby worked at Adamana soon after high school, which is a holding ground for natural gas near Holbrook to earn money for his mission. Soon Bobby got a call <clears throat> to the Netherlands Amsterdam mission. He entered the MTC, now it's called MTC, then it was called the Language Training, Language Training Mission, and was off for another adventure. Dutch was really hard for Bobby to learn, but with his ability and his talents of knowing how to work hard, he learned the language and he learned it well. He had some success in a very difficult mission and grew to love and cherish these people. At around the year mark, Bobby was involved in a serious bike accident, which injured his knee. He most likely should have been killed, but another miracle occurred in his life. And he was spared. The unfortunate thing for him is because of the injury he had to return home to receive some medical care, which resulted in him receiving an honorable medical discharge from his mission. I remember um, he longed to be back on his mission. Thank goodness for people like Hank Jensen and Martha um, Larson, who both grew up in the Netherlands and they lived near Holbrook. Bobby was able to converse in Dutch with them and enjoy memories together of their beloved Netherlands. After his recovery from his mission accident, Bobby moved down to Mesa, Arizona, and soon was employed by Farnsworth Construction, I think is what it was called at that point. Early mornings were, were the best in the valley, and when I'm talking early mornings, I'm talking like 2 a.m. Especially in the summer when the temperatures exceeded 115 degrees. On one occasion, um, while he was working, um, he was asked to go on a blind date with a friend of one of our cousins, Susie Dastro. <laughs> the blind date's name was Roxanne Copernicus. I'm not quite sure how successful or impressive that first date was. Um, however, with much persistence and hard work, probably more Nazis than Bobby's, love began to blossom. On, on April 6, 1979, Bobby and Roxy were married in the Mesa, Arizona temple for time and all eternity. Another miracle in the life of Bobby Fisher that he paid and that has paid many eternal dividends. With this sacred union, there have been nine beautiful children. Robert, Adam, Katie, Robin, Amy, Seth, Elena, Camille, and Emma. Each of them have brought honor to Bobby Moxie. 
I've also been blessed with 33 grandchildren and more to come. Couldn't ask for more. <laughs> Bobby, earlier on in their mission, served in the Army for a time. He honorably served his country for the few years that he was in the service. I remember we had an opportunity to go to, to Fort Bliss, which was in El Paso, Texas, to see them uh, before I left on my mission. And if I remember right, um, he was able to be furloughed before he actually went on more assignments um, to bless Robert. Um, he came home for that. Soon after his discharge, Bobby and Roxy moved to Holbrook. <coughs> He eventually obtained employment with Troy Power Plant, a coal fire power plant near Joseph City, Arizona. After a few years, Bobby had an opportunity to transfer to Phoenix and work at Palo Verde Nuclear Power Plant. After extensive training, he was hired on in additional duties as a control room operator of that nuclear plant. He became experienced in all facets of nuclear power generation, and he was always willing to tell you how power was generated <laughs> and to, what to watch for to safely generate power. <laughs> Ask the kids about that one. <laughs> he retired after working for APS in Delco West um, after about 35 years. Soon after, they moved to the beloved area of Fairview, Idaho, where they have resided since. Bobby has always had strong spiritual connections to family and the gospel. He was and is a warrior for truth and righteousness. He was never, never afraid to help other people see his point of view <laughs> and how they could also be the testimony of what he knew was the truth. He was a champion of diligently following the Savior's example. And Bobby wouldn't be the awesome brother, husband, father, grandfather, and friend if it wasn't for his eternal sweetheart with companion Roxy. Thank you, Roxy for being such a wonderful companion to my brother and making him one of the happiest men ever. Thank you also for being an example of faith and devotion, especially these past weeks and months. Bobby is one of my heroes. His farewell is comparable to the verses recorded by Paul in the New Testament. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is a lay, there is laid for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to all, and to all them also that love his appearing. I agree with one of Bobby and Roxy's children. We have seen miracle after miracle after miracle. God is good. My dear brother, God be with you. So we meet again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
enough yet. My dad loves Jesus Christ. And his whole life was dedicated to him. And to have his funeral in some part worship him, I think would have really, well, it does really please him. It is my assignment to present some memories of my dad. But how can one adequately share so many experiences of such a dynamic person? I've tried, though. I've tried to collect small moments and memories and hopefully together we'll piece a picture of, of him. A lot of them I found on Facebook, so if you put it there, sorry about it, it was dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to sign anything or anything. So I'm really glad that Uncle Sam shared about Richard Tanner, Dad's best friend growing up. Richard Tanner sent us a memory. There was this police officer <laughs> that had harassed us because we raced on his streets every night. <laughs> All Bobby, I am sure. I think that's how it goes between them, right? I, I felt a lot of blaming. I don't know, ever know. Well, one night we got the idea of making a couple of acetylene bombs where you got the perfect flame on a torch I don't like how he explains this. Perfect flame on the porch. Stamp it out on a block of wood. Fill the balloon with the gas. As long as you light it out in the open, it makes a huge boom, like a stick of dynamite. But it doesn't do any, any damage. So we fill two balloons with this gas. <laughs> Not a normal balloon, but two 70 cent, 75 cent balloons, which at the time were huge. Bigger is better, right? Like, we, blew, we put the balloons in his old van with the stove pipe out the side and drove in the snowflake to make this cop's night. <laughs> we wrapped toilet paper fuse around the balloons and lit them around 2 a.m. in his front yard. <laughs> we had driven clear across town when they went off, and they were still loud. <laughs> we laughed almost the whole way home. <laughs> so many memories of this guy. He also was the one that helped prepare me for a mission. Got me up early for scripture study. Kept me out of many bad situations. He was a real friend. Like the kind that only comes around once in a lifetime. <laughs> I haven't talked to him in years, but to me, he will always be my best friend. I think many felt that love for my dad. He had such a warmth and a love for people. Many people shared and shared with our family that he would come to church, give them a huge smile and a bear hug, like he had been waiting to see them all week. Our really good friend Tara Harper shared an experience of uh, growing up. So many of my childhood memories are with your family. I thought we were cousins and I was pretty upset when I learned we weren't. <laughs> One of my favorite memories of your dad is when I was really young. I was staying at your house overnight for a few days and at night your dad would pray individually with each of his kids. Kneeling down at the bed. No. I remember just watching with my eyes open, wondering what the heck was going on. <laughs> we had never done that in my house. And when he said it was my turn, I just shook my head. <laughs> no. <laughs> I had no idea what to do. 
he just called me, told me the steps for prayer, and helped me pray. He has always been a spirit giant, spiritual giant to me, and someone I've always looked up to in so many ways. I love knowing that he taught me to pray for the first time. Bobby was larger than life. He always made me feel like he was so happy to see me and gave the best hugs. I've also been on the receiving end of his disapproval as a kid. When we were being naughty, just with the look on his face and the raise of his eyebrow, you knew you were in trouble. I can't remember how many times when dad would fish up. He was sitting on the stand, of course, and mom would say, Look at him. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> you know the look. <laughs> when a friend shared on Facebook that this the infamous snap. I don't know. The whole board didn't know who he was snapping at, but everyone sat up a little bit straighter <laughs> and improved their behavior. <laughs> um, Mom taught piano lessons for a long time. We always had students coming in and out. It's, I have a lot of memories of, you know, trying really hard to be quiet while she taught. Didn't really work, but um, Kayla, Kayla used to be Barnes, now Owens, shares an experience. Um, but that she remembers that she was at the house for piano lessons when he came home and said, before he even looked in the room, someone's using too much pedal. <laughs> <laughs> then when he saw who I was, <laughs> all apologies. Sorry, that was on my kid's flame. <laughs> so friendly about it, didn't feel but she says, I did check my use of the pedal out. <laughs> One of the highlights of my dad's life was being called to be the show. He always wanted to be available for the Savior if ever he needed them, needed him at any moment's time, no matter the cost, no matter the sacrifice. No matter if he looked foolish, didn't matter to him. He wanted to be there. While he was bishop, Phyllis Clausen shares, I remember at one time he was speaking in church as bishop. I remember in the middle of the talk, he stopped. And you could tell he was listening intently. I know he was listening to the Spirit to tell him what to teach. There was at least a 45-second to one-minute pause. And then he started to teach us again. I knew without a doubt that what he was teaching came directly from the Lord for our Lord. That was the Bobby Fisher I know, remember, and love. Dad has a single daughter. He has been my priest of the year for my life. And I have been a recipient of those moments when inspiration came to him for me. I knew that. Heidi Luki shared some really fun things. But one of her, she's a, a lady in the ward that has some great memories of my dad. And she shares, one of my favorite memories of him was not a direct interaction with him, but rather watching him from the flock. Ross, her husband, and I just moved into the area and were leaving from church that first Sunday. There was this astronomical passenger van in front of us <laughs> at the Campbell State Center, sort of blocking our way to get around. And your mom came out. It seemed like the whole family was waiting for her. And once the sun hit your mom's face, your dad jumped out of the van and ran around the passenger door and opened it for her. We knew that was the family we wanted to be wanted as a friend. 
And then she continues to bring up the finger snap. Um, my dad really loved my mom. Mom will always say how different they were in personality. But they were united in some really important things. They both are 100% devoted to the Savior and to him. Jeray Wilson shares, my heart is with you. My memories of him when I was young, I was really little, and your mom would babysit me. You guys had a bunk bed that was like a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I was so young, but memories are like flashes. His smiles is one of those flashes. He also made me eat the crust of my sandwiches. <laughs> I think that post right there summarizes so much for me. Yeah, he did. My dad really cherished, cherished his relationship with his priesthood leader, Russ Gilliland. President Gilliland posted very sweet tribute to my dad. And I know he'd be proud of this one. I first learned of your father's illness in ensuing weeks of hospitalization um, and have had him on my mind. He will always be Bishop Fisher to me since we serve so closely together. I've always admired your parents and your family from, from afar. Do you remember when we invited your family to a family home evening activity at the Bernie River, where we cooked our hot dogs and played in the water? That was us, our attempt to spark some interaction between our dating age children. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of memories of your dad at girls camp. Um, and watching your kind and loving mother in so many different activities with the girls. Of course, when the inspiration came to call your dad to serve as bishop, I wondered how he would be able to juggle the demands of the calling with his schedule at the power plant. He accepted without equivocating and served without ever complaining about the schedule. He was a strong bishop and absolutely sustaining toward me as his priesthood leader. He was fearless in tackling the difficult cases and ine inevitable that inevitably arise and yet always willing to seek and follow counsel. I loved his cheerful disposition and happy smile. I truly felt those lasting bonds of friendship that developed when we are engaged in the service of the Lord and others. I sought his input in larger group settings and felt his love in our monthly priesthood interviews. I know because of the covenants made and kept that yours is the blessing of peace, which passes understanding as you navigate these next few weeks and years. I know that he is very much interested and engaged in the welfare of your family, even from the other side of the world. I know that's true. I have felt so much peace. And I know my family has felt so much peace in this room. Peace that cannot be explained except through the atonement of Jesus Christ. The sting of death truly has been swallowed up in him. Dad served as a high counselor for a while, and uh, for what for uh, one of his assignments had to speak in a Spanish ward. Um he was assigned with someone else, and uh, it became really apparent at the time that they didn't have anyone to play the piano. So he quickly um, chimed in and said, I don't know how to play the piano, and would be happy to play. And then he added, with a raised eyebrow and a smile, I don't know how, if I can play in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> There are so many memories to share. So many that I have. I can't share them all. But Dad was fun. He 
You drove me crazy. <laughs> Absolutely nuts. But I loved him with my whole heart. I knew he was proud of me. I knew he loved me. We were young, he would correct, but always trying to give an added measure of love, which I hated. Mm -hmm. Like, just let me grieve alone for a minute. <laughs> And always give you a hug. Always knew, made sure that you knew that he loved you. There are two things in God's life that matter to him more than anything else. His family and his Savior. I know that he's still going to be with us. To protect us. <laughs> to help guide us. And there's no one else I'd rather have protect you and help guide you. I really love him and I'm so grateful for the Savior. He made dad a better man than he was. And because of him, we get to be with him forever. I'm going to tease him so bad on the other side. I love Dad. I'm glad this for me. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
it was awesome. I just want to know if you were feeling that or not. <laughs> just a little bit. Um, I'm Brother Rick Harris. Um, I've had to speak in some crazy situations in my life. Um, a few weeks ago, when we got done with our sacred meeting, I went down to uh, see my wife and got down there, and Bobby and Roxy had came, and I went up and shake Bobby's hand, and he said, brothers don't shake hands, brothers hug. And he, he brought me in and, and hugged the crap out of me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> in these speaking situations, I've had to, uh, I've labeled, labeled them and gave them kind of stupid titles. My father's was an M&M, and uh, I think uh, Brother Bobby and Roxy are magnetic. They are magnetic. Doesn't matter where you come from, it don't matter who you are, you don't need to know them. They just like the room. Bobby's spirit is overwhelming. His enthusiasm, his love, his devotion is broad. It encompasses everything. And so, some of my experiences was with Roxy and Bobby at the same time. We did a lot of cool things in one of our classes we did that drove home uh, the mission of Bobby and Roxy that they want to give to the family, which is they love God. And will do whatever it takes to raise their family that same way. Now, I also was reading something, and I know it shocks you that I read, but I was listening to something. Um, Joseph Beth Smith was giving a talk about Moroni writing some things down that his father Mormon was, was telling him and teaching him. And in one of his talks, he says, I desire to impress this thought upon your minds, for I want you to understand that this is the meaning intended to be conveyed by the words. Enter into the rest of God. Let me assure you that man who is not thoroughly established in the doctrine of Christ, who has not yielded his whole soul unto the Lord and to the gospel he has taught to the world, has not yet entered into that rest. Now rest assured that uh, there's scriptures that uh, back up faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye sealed to the glory of God. I didn't think about this until I heard someone else speak about it, and I thought the same thing about Bobby. Bobby ended his life without faith. He'd surpass faith. All of us have to live on faith because we have certain things that we, we're just living on faith, hoping that things come about. Not Bobby. He'd surpassed faith and replaced it with the love of the Savior. Bobby's actions, his thoughts, his demeanor, his motivation, his love was that of the Savior. He didn't have to have faith no more. He knew God, he knew Jesus Christ, and he loved his wife. And most importantly, he loved his family. So, Bobby's game plan is to follow his example to his family. And that is it. Endure your life. And someday you'll be able to replace faith with pure knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. That is my testimony for myself, that someday that I will be able to learn and grow to the same point that Bobby has been and done for his family. Follow the game plan and you'll win. Bobby has won. And his promises, his commitments, 
and things that he has made with his heavenly father and savior is to build you a home on the other side mansions above and he is there building and working i know that for sure because i have another one on the other side doing the same i know that god lives i know that jesus christ lives I know that he can redeem us all, and he will. I know that uh, pain and suffering hits us here. It's a human thing that tears us up. But this is the one time that you will recognize that God and the Savior will carry. They have big arms, and they will walk with you when you are not doing the walking yourself. This journey is awesome. Enjoy the journey. Love our Heavenly Father and our Savior Jesus Christ, and you will all win. I say, Saints, the Son of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. My brother Harris, I'm humbled to be here today. What a, what a beautiful memorial. What a beautiful funeral. I appreciate the, the thoughts. <coughs> The testimonies, the music, and I know I just can see Bobby with a smile this wide right now. I don't, I've never seen him any different, actually. I, I first met Bobby at a cannery assignment when we moved here about seven years ago. And uh, cannery assignments are good, but I just thought, this guy is really happy to be at the cannery. <laughs> He just was thrilled, just absolutely thrilled, not just to be at the cannery, but to meet me and everyone else, and uh, Bobby is just full of love, just full of Christ-like love, and that comes from a lifetime of faith and service, and he, he did it. Every time I saw him, like, like Rick said, big hug, and you just feel love. With Bobby and Roxy. And I just love that. I will miss walking into the Fairview building and not having Bobby there with a big smile on his face ready to give you a hug. A couple months ago in a state presidency meeting, we were working on some colleagues and we needed to find a couple to serve as missionaries in our state. And it's a tough calling. It's a it's a full-time calling. It's a live-at-home missionary calling. And as we talked there for a minute, I said, I know exactly who we need to call. We need to call Bobby and Roxy as missionaries. And my counselor, who was your bishop, looked at me and said, perfect, absolutely, that's who we need. And uh, I talked to the bishop about it and felt like we had our answer. And as we prayed about it and proceeded to move forward, we were constrained in doing so. And we didn't do it. I know that the Lord is aware of us and He has a plan for each one of us. As I look out at you kids and grandkids, here's think about this statement. Children are simply messengers we send to a place that we will never see. And that place is the future. And I look at you kids and grandkids and go, what is the message? You're each messengers. You're going to take a message into the future that the rest of us aren't going to be there for. I know what that message is. That message is love and faith and family and joy and testimony. That's the message that each of you are going to take to that place that the rest of us will never see. What do you do to best convey that message? Very simple. Do your best. Do your very best in all that you do. There's some distinct places on this earth that testify to the divine nature of our souls. And three of them that I've thought of, three of the times on this earth when you just truly feel and know of the plan. One is in the delivery room when that little baby is born and you look into its eyes to me, that is just divine. Another time is kneeling around the altar or experiencing a family, kneeling around the altar in the temple being sealed for eternity. That's one of those times. 
Another time is at the funeral of a loved one. To me, I just feel so much faith and power and love as I think about what has been discussed here, the life of Brother Fisher, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The three deepest questions on this earth, I think, are where did we come from, why are we here, and where are we going? And those require some faith to answer, but I know that those answers are real. I have received those answers in my life. This mortal life, I think of, of uh, when we left our Father in Heaven's presence to come here. We probably were much like an 18-year-old kid. And our dad's out there going, hey, don't forget to check the oil on the car. And check it, keep an eye on your checkbook and your balance in your account. And do this and do that. And we probably said, you know what? I got this. Really, I'm good. I got this. I know exactly what I'm doing. Can't wait to take off and go to church. And our Father in Heaven probably looked at us and thought, you have no idea. You have no idea what's ahead of you. But I'm sure, like parents, he rejoiced in this opportunity we have to come and experience love, joy, pain, sorrow, difficulty. And I think what, what a divine learning experience. And that's why we're here. We are here to gain experience that will teach us compassion, that will prepare us for greater things ahead. We need to strive. Our purpose here is to be tested and to pass the test and to strive, to love God, to serve our fellow man. It's tough at a funeral. It's tough to feel, feel the sorrow of mourning. Elder LeGrand Richard said the only reason to feel sorrow at the death of a loved one is the temporary loss of friendship privilege. It truly is a temporary loss of friendship privilege, and that is due to the covenants of the temple that makes that loss temporary. At the moment of death, the living spirit separates from the body. And we know it when we look into a casket. The face is familiar, but that energy that lights the eyes and brings life to the soul is not there. But that doesn't mean that that's gone or dead. That spirit has moved on. And in Alma 40, it says, Now concerning the state of the soul between the death and resurrection, behold, it has been made known unto me by an angel that the spirits of all men, as soon as they are departed from this mortal body, yea, the spirits of all men, whether they be good or evil, are taken home to that God who gave them life. And then shall it come to pass that the spirits of those who are righteous are received into a state of happiness which is called paradise, a state of rest, a state of peace, where they rest from all their troubles and all their care, and so on. This is a wonderful plan of a loving Father in heaven to help us to be able to return truly pure and clean back to him. And it is only through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we can do it. We have a bridge to cross that we cannot cross alone. We have two of them. One of them is death, and one of them is sin. Both of those disqualify us from returning to Father in heaven. And because of our Savior, we can do it. His, his death and resurrection bridges that gap for us. His atonement, his suffering for our sin bridges that gap for us as we repent. And I've learned a little bit about grace this year as we study the Book of Mormon. There are two scriptures from the prophet Moroni that teach me how we do this. In Ether 12, 27, the prophet Moroni said, and if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. And I read that and I said, you know what, I can do that. I have plenty of weaknesses in my life. And it's pretty easy for me to kneel down at night and consider my weaknesses and be humble. So therefore, I can make it. I can be humble, and I can make it. Later, in Moroni 10.32, the same prophet Moroni teaches, Yea, come unto Christ, and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace ye may become perfect in Christ. And I thought, okay, that's a little harder than just being humble. I can be humble, 
We also need to deny ourselves of ungodliness and love God with all our heart, might, mind, and strength. As we center our lives around our Savior, great peace, great joy, and great hope can come into our hearts, even during trials and tribulation. Because of that atonement, every difficult, hard, sad thing we have on this earth will be temporary. And because of that atonement, every joy, every happiness, all the good things in our life are going to last forever. I testify that the loss in the morning you feel is a temporary loss, a friendship privilege, that you will be restored to your loving father and grandfather through those temple covenants. Once again, I will miss Bobby. I will miss his genuine love, that Christ-like love. But I know each of us have it within us to be able to do what he did and share what he shared. I know that this is the church of Jesus Christ restored to the earth through a living prophet, or through a prophet Joseph Smith. That the prophet Joseph saw what he said he saw. That through the priesthood that was restored, these temple covenants can bind us forever. I know that the plan of salvation is real. The fact we can't remember it makes it no less real. We have the potential to live forever in joy and peace as families. Each of us will be totally and completely dependent upon the mercy of Jesus Christ someday. And I know I will be. I know that he lives. I know that he died and was resurrected for us. And I leave you my testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
this opportunity uh, to, to spend today's family with friends and loved ones. Reminisce of the life of Poppy and the good that he's done for so many lives. Help us to remember that he is with us. Salvation is within many of us, if not all. Throughout this day, we will fill it with his love, his comfort, his peace, and his joy. We will understand the plan of salvation. There's no way around the door. You have to go through the body of God with the highest regards, believing and trusting in the plan of salvation. Well received, and he is preparing the way for each and every one of us. As he to give us comfort in knowing the love that he has for each of us and those that he hasn't even reached out to, that he loves everyone. His smile and his laughter is with us all. We're grateful for him, the example that he set. All to fall. We ask thee to let thy spirit be with us. Give us comfort and peace throughout this day, throughout our lives, knowing that Bobby is with us and never leave us. He's chose to continue in service and never stop. Prepare the way. And again, thank thee for this time, this opportunity to reminisce the life of Bobby. The love that he has for each of us. We say this in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Please stand. One of the pall bearers come up. I'd like to invite those who are in the pall bearers if you come here to the front, please. <laughs> You guys want to come? I'm going to keep one of you there, though. You stay there, and the rest of you will come out here. And then, if you guys want to follow us out or listen, and you guys, you were in charge of that a minute ago, hold on to that for one second, do it, okay? Just follow us out, okay?
It's fine. You can get it in the middle. It's just a microphone read after that. So. 